Pete Early, the author of Comrade J, and uh, Sergei Trechikov, uh, the subject of Comrade J. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for being my guest this morning. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I would like to start with you, Pete. Huh? This is a, an extraordinary story. Uh, it is a story that is, it is the most up-to-date story we have had of a, a, an intelligence officer of uh, Sergei Trechikov's rank choosing to defect to the United States. And he tells an incredible story. And as I read the book, which is quite fascinating, one of the first things that happened when you were approached about doing this story was you said, no, you were not interested. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think it would be interesting for us to know, how did you become interested? Well, I became interested uh, when I actually met Sergei. I, received, I had done books about the John Walker spy case and about Aldrey James, the CIA traitor. And uh, periodically, I got calls from people from the KGB saying, oh, I want to tell you my life story. And most of them weren't very interesting. And so I said, no, I'm not interested, I'm not interested. And then a friend of mine from the FBI called. And he said, you need to meet this person. He didn't give me a name. And so I said, okay. And then it was very dramatic. I, I, they told me, arrive at this place at this time. And when I got there, two FBI agents were there. They took me up to a suite where there were two CIA agents and in walked Sergei. And they, I knew instantly that he was somebody important because I actually remembered his name from when he defected. And he was a mystery. He defected in 2000 and disappeared off the grid. And I knew he was the highest ranking Russian intelligence officer to defect. And of course then, as I spoke to him, the story got better and better. Well, you tell a fascinating story. Let's turn to Sergei Trechikov. You took an extraordinary step with your life. Yes. Uh, you took an extraordinary <clears throat> risk with your life. Uh, we're very fortunate to be with us today. We're very glad to have you. Let me go back to rather than go all the way back in your life, which I would like to do to an extent, I would just like to ask, you have now lived in the United States uh, since you came actually to uh, Manhattan to be the number two head of what would be the equivalent of a CIA station, the Residentura. Mm -hmm. uh, you chose to defect in 2000. You've now lived here uh, since that time, so in almost 10 years. Um. Eight years. Mm -hmm. Eight yeah, years. Right. 2000. I escaped uh, in October 2000. Yes, October 2000. And you have also since then become an American citizen. Two years ago, uh, we became American citizens. I mean, uh, my wife, my daughter, and myself. And we're very proud, and it was one of the happiest days in our lives. The story of Comrade J, which would have been your name inside the, inside the KGB, um, was Comrade Jean, as I... As I as John. John. French. Yes. And you would have been a, a... And you depict yourself as an extraordinary loyal, uh, very effective uh, uh, KGB, later SVR, SVR officer. That was the successor organization. And yet... Uh, the story that you tell is one of great, great disillusionment. Mm -hmm. Can you just, in a, in a few words, give us a sense of the nature of that disillusionment? Because you had everything going for him. You were a success story. You had come in, you had been trained, you had survived the sort of vicious infighting that can take place in the KGB, later SVR, and you were on the, you were on the cusp of becoming a general. And being a general in the KGB uh, is equivalent to having arrived. It is, it is the sea, it is the top position. And yet you became disillusioned. What was behind that disillusionment? First of all, I was raised as a patriot. And when I chose to work for the KGB, for the Russian intelligence, it, was, it wasn't the matter of money. It was the matter uh, I wanted to serve my country in the most effective way. And I thought that intelligence is one of the, uh, of the best opportunities. I had a skyrocketing career. For three years in, in the beginning of my career, I was the head of the Young Communist League of the Intelligence. 
Uh, I was uh, captain at the time, but my status was of a lieutenant general. Uh, I was always successful, and uh, people like me usually don't defect. I never had any financial issues, problems. I was a successful officer. Definitely, uh, if I returned back to Russia, I would be general or even something more. That means that general or with a very high position. I was offered many uh, positions like this. And then I defected. Probably for my former colleagues, it's the main question they're asking. What drove this guy to, the, to, to that decision? Uh, when I was the head of, for example, Young Communist League, Komsomol of the intelligence, uh, a lot of dramatic uh, events took place in the intelligence. Uh, people who were betrayed by Ames, then Hansen, were arrested and executed. And I attended <clears throat> some trials on Varovsky Street. It's where they were trialed. Believe me, even for someone with a good nervous system, it's quite an experience to attend these trials. Uh, they were all uh, organized uh, to scare us, to show what will happen to you if you defect or if you do something wrong. It means in my particular case, I knew what exactly awaits me in case of failure. Because all these people who were executed, they never had, they never was even close to my position in the intelligence. But again, uh, it was a dramatic decision. Uh, we became disillusioned. We, I mean, the whole family. First of all, my wife and myself, because daughter, my daughter was too young just to to think about things like this at that time. Uh, and to make this story short, I decided, we decided to do something, finally, to do something useful in our lives and not to serve the people who call themselves a Russian government and uh, who perform, in my opinion, the genocide of Russian people, of people who live in, in, in Russia. And I had a choice to become part of this genocidal team or to do something else. You know, you, you describe uh, going to the trials of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, KGB officers who were tried and executed. I'm thinking there's one incident in your book uh, within a few pages where there were, in fact, uh, uh, trials and executions of three officers, Pigasov, Motorin, and uh, yeah. Polyakov. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were then, I think, about 29 years old. Roughly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. Uh, you described going to a, KG, a dinner of other KGB officers where the executions were announced, when the executions were announced, and everyone stood and applauded. Yes. Um, and I was among those who applauded. But, I, I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but in the book, it's quite clear that, that and you say in one, in one passage that you realized that you were in an organization where to succeed you had to be a wolf. And yeah. so you would have sh just as sharper teeth than anyone else. Absolutely. But having joined, the, the, having been in the Young Pioneers, have, having been quite patriotic, you, you were a true believer. We use that phrase, a true Absolutely. believer. What was it like then as you moved up the ranks and you were exposed to this uh, uh, incredibly intimidating situation, execution, uh, everybody applauds. And then you also, and this comes out so clearly in the book, the very vicious infighting inside the KGB, yes. where people would stab one another in the back. And, and yet you still, there were certain people you trusted, but others that, that you, I mean, it was, there were so many people you could not trust. I mean, it, was just, it sounds like a, a, an incredibly almost gangster-like situation. Yes. To some extent, yes. The life in KGB, the whole logic of KGB, it's quite difficult to understand for worseness for Americans. 
uh, that organization was very cruel towards the, the population. But believe me, this organization was even much more cruel towards, towards their own representatives, uh, like these ex executions. And I remember Khrushchev, who deceased not long ago, he was the head at that time of the first chief directorate of KGB intelligence. Uh, he was very proud to announce, like, uh, traitor Matorin executed, and we're all standing and applauding. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm rethinking this situation, you know, and I was asking myself, uh, what I thought at that time, when I was applauding too, I knew Matorin, he was a very nice guy. And I felt pity for him. He is a human guy, uh, being, he is a nice person. But I thought, yes, it's the way to go. He betrayed the organization, he betrayed the country. And uh, you must understand how dramatic it was to me, to my family, to go, uh, to become what we became. Yes. And uh, I always uh, underline that I never did it for money. I was never approached. I had a very bad reputation. I was never seduced. I was never bought. It was our decision. And I don't regret even for one minute that we started doing what we, what we did. Let me just ask you, uh, Peter Lee, when you met mm -hmm. uh, Sergei and, and then you began, sat down to do your interviews, mm -hmm. and you described something like 126 hours of taped right. interviews, that you, plus just your normal conversation, did you have the sense of a, a man with a great weight on him that was being lifted? In other words, what was your sense of Sergei the man? I was, you know, I had done interviews with John Walker, the spy, the naval officer who betrayed our country. I've done interviews with Alder James, who, of course, was responsible for CIA deaths. And, of course, I went into this trying to think, how is he different? How is he going to be different? And I remember when I was in Moscow and I interviewed General Boris Solomatin, who was perhaps one of the greatest KGB Cold Warriors who really attacked the United States. It was very... And he said, there is no romance with Americans. It's always the money. And that was the first thing that I saw was so different about Sergei. He wasn't interested in doing this for the money. He had changed uh, his whole attitude. And he had, as he describes, an allergy towards the new Russians who had come into power. He saw the corruption. He saw the greed. He tells a story about one officer who worked for him who was a lousy officer who he wanted to get rid of, but he was just stealing so much money for the people back in Moscow, they were giving him awards. This betrayed everything. But I think one of the most telling things about Sergei is, he not only helped us, he joined us. He's a U.S. citizen. Uh, you never saw Walker, you never saw Ames, you never saw these kind of people saying, I want to live in Russia, you know, I want your money. But he, it was not money, and I think that is a key motivation and understanding him. Uh, you know, there were many times when we'd have conversations where I'd say, Sergey, uh, trust me, the United States is, is, is not as great as you think it is. And he'd say, oh, no, 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 trust me. It is better than you know it is, having grown up here. You're spoiled. You don't understand what it's really like to live like I lived. So this, this man not only says he's put his life on the line, but he believes this. And that was a distinct difference. And when people say, oh, you know, uh, uh, Walker, Ames, Sergei, uh, they're, they are not from the same mold. Why don't we stay with that, that subject? You've now been here as a citizen. You now are a citizen, mm -hmm. taken the pledge, become an American citizen, you yes. and your wife. You are now a daughter. And your daughter. And you now have had an opportunity to see America as they say, warts and all. And you see the things that Pete and I could now sit down and complain about. 
you know, whether it's the, the, this, this election system that's now run for two years and we still have no <laughs> idea. I mean, the British do it in six weeks, it takes us two years. But the other things, the problems with our economy, uh, the inequities in, in, our, in our system, in, our, in medical insurance, uh, you know, one of the great visions of socialism, of course, was to have universal medical care, and that was that was part of the vision that you bought into as a young as a young Soviet, later as a Russian, and now you see that we do have inequities that is that is not fair for everybody. So you've had a chance to get a perspective on your original vision of America as a hope for you and representing a better life. Do you still feel that way? Absolutely. First of all, there are no ideal countries. I never idealized, for example, Russian uh, American foreign policy. There are a lot of things in the society, like you mentioned them, uh, which need to be improved. But my vision of Americans and America, Americans and America make mistakes. But then, then they, uh, they correct them. Then they move forward. Then again, they make mistakes. But then they move forward. I always feel a progress. Uh, again, with the understanding that I'm not idealizing a lot of things, which I, I, I can see in this country. By, but still, I think United States is the main promoter of democracy and the leader of the world. And, uh, for example, if we ad uh, admit that I worked for, for American government, I would never work for any other government. Why? Because this is the country which leads the world. And it's my, uh, my, it's my belief. Uh, sometimes Pete, uh, he is more skeptical, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's but, what we believe in the power of the whole family. Peter, one interesting thing, though, is although, and, and this is a man who was a high-ranking Russian intelligence officer, and I say in the book that he worked for the CIA and the FBI for our country for many years, taking over 5,000 top-secret documents out. He will still tell you, and he can correct me if I'm, he will correct me if I'm wrong, that he believes Russian intelligence is better. I, I can't because I, I never worked in uh, in American intelligence, but I uh, assume that according to the to the information known to the public, Russian intelligence was the most effective in the world. One of the reasons, first of all, Russian intelligence was a rather cruel system. They were always pushing you to the edge. I remember in New York residency, General Trubnikov came. He was the head of the intelligence. We were all gathered in this T intersection in the residency. And um, he was talking about the, what's going on in the, in the center, just informing us about the, the politics, whatever. But then he says, uh, colleagues, please remember, if you are successful, successful in recruiting, you will have better apartment, we'll promote you, we'll decorate you, but if it's a failure, we'll crucify you. This is a very kgb approach. And then we had a private conversation and I asked him, Vyacheslav Ivanovich, there is no logic because if you risk your life for the country, the country must, you must have a wall behind you. And he told me, Sergei, you know, you know the system the same way as I, I, I know, it, how it works. But uh, in order to be successful in the Russian intelligence, you must achieve concrete results. Concrete results, recruitment. And Russian intelligence, uh, historically, traditionally relies upon mainly human intelligence. All these bugs, satellites, interception, it's good, it's effective, but it's auxiliary. Main have sources, human sources. And uh, this is the whole uh, 
logic of an organization, the school of the organization. They teach you how to recruit. They want you to recruit people. And sometimes when I analyze some cases, I thought, oh, it's, it's not possible. No, it's possible. When you start working, you can achieve amazing results. Before you start working, you think, oh, no, 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 it's, it's nonsense. We can't recruit someone like this. And then we start working, and then you see the result. It works. Uh, I know that uh, among the operations and operational activities that you were in charge of in, in, when you were in Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, was what we call covert action. Mm -hmm. and, and that was in trying to promote both dissension and unrest within the United States, to mm -hmm. the extent you could, and anti-Americanism abroad to, to help give Absolutely. America black eye. I wonder if you could chat a bit about that. Uh, it's called MS in Russian, Measures of Support. Before, uh, it was called Active Measures. It was Department A in the, uh, uh, in the Russian intelligence. When uh, Soviet Union ceased to exist, and people start thinking, uh, started thinking that Cold War is over, I know that the American side was asking Russians, guys, please stop these active measures. They are very embarrassing. Uh, Russians agreed, and they changed the title from Department A, Department MS, same people, same mechanism, same approach, nothing changed. And actually, it's a very effective mechanism and very cheap mechanism to embarrass, uh, to embarrass other countries. What? Examples, for example, like uh, in Europe, something, something simple. Uh, if you have a source, journalist, or some other sources, who can publish something like this? For example, uh, mean Americans planted nuclear devices on the territory of, of Germany. In case of war, if Russian tanks start advancing to Europe, they'll blow these nuclear devices and then they destroy Russian military machine. But Germany with the Russian military machine. And when the information like this goes to, uh, to the circles of population uh, which are not that prepared to analyze things, they start thinking, oh, Americans, they are bad people, etc. Uh, in the book, there is an example of uh, nuclear winter. Yes. Which was very embarrassing for the, for the United States. Uh, when uh, Soviet Union ceased to exist, when KGB disappeared, when uh, SVR took over all the functions of former KGB abroad, active measures became, believe me, it was my job, more aggressive and more... Um, numerous than it was during the Soviet Union. Well, I don't know if we can quite attribute it to the KGB SVR, but there is a lot of anti-Americanism now around the world, some of which we've brought on ourselves, but from what you say, from what you say, America remains a top priority, Absolutely. a top target within the SVR, both to foster anti-Americanism as well as to create dissension within. Pete, you had a comment. Well, one of the, you were acting, asking about active measures. One of the things Sergei talks about is how Moscow would send instructions to New York and uh, many of his officers would be dispatched to the New York Public Library to get onto the computer so they'd hide their identity to just put out reports and statements that would be like 98% factual but have a little twist in there. A lot of them about Chechnya trying to turn public opinion and they'd flood the internet with these that look legitimate in hopes that someone would pick up you know some little nugget uh, you know Sergey talks about the end of the Cold War and 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 uh, can you tell him about the target thing I mean uh, that people uh, ask me all the time what changed after the Cold War was over uh, who told you that Cold War was ever over <laughs> Uh, in Russian military doctrine, Soviet military doctrine, there was an official definition of a uh, main enemy. United States, NATO, in China. In today's intelligence doctrine, there is definition of main targets. 
United States, NATO, and China. For me, uh, the previous definition, potential main enemy, is less aggressive. It's potential. But when you are my main target, you are my main target right now, not potentially. It means even in theory nothing changed. Even on, on, on the level of, uh, of uh, doctrine. You know. The other thing is, uh, as you know, in Russian uh, government, there are a lot of people with KGB background, including President Putin. Uh, we all have, how they say, it, brains made in the same, in the same factory. KGB factory. <laughs> yes, KGB factory. <laughs> and uh, traditionally, we never trusted information from the MFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, not because it was bad information, but it was open information. The information which you can get from the newspapers. We all trusted in intelligence information, which was more, more secret, more accurate, and that's why demand for the uh, intelligence information in today's Russian government is uh, probably higher than it was during the Soviet period. Because not so many KGBs were in real power at that time in Russia. I remember uh, it was 2000, it was August, I think. The advanced team came before Putin came to attend the General Assembly. And General Murov, the head of the secret Russian uh, FSO, equivalent of American Secret Service, uh, was instructing Lavrov. And uh, he was, by the way, he was already drunk at the time. But anyway, he was telling him, please, I want to remind you that Mr. Putin relies upon information from these guys. Support them and make their life e as easy as possible. Actually, I never had, we never had any problems with Lavrov. We coexisted very peacefully, very productively. And I think that Lavrov was never offended uh, in his whole professional career like that. Okay. Uh, why don't we take a break now? And when we come back, I'd like to address the issue of, one, of a person you considered one of the most important reporting sources in the United States. Afterwards, and several other C-SPAN programs are available for download as podcasts. More with Pete Early, Sergei Tretikov, and Peter Ernest in a moment. As executive producer of the Washington Journal, I know that viewer calls are an important part of our on-air programming. It's part of who we are. We're committed to opening up the phone lines so you can talk directly to journalists, elected officials, and other decision makers. We began taking calls during the 1980 presidential campaign, which made us the first nationwide daytime call-in program on television. And ever since then, we've been inviting viewers to call in, speak, and be heard. We take calls each morning on the Washington Journal, during our coverage of Congress, on the campaign trail, after important speeches, and as a part of our key event coverage. Our aim is to hear from many different points of view from across the political spectrum. So if you ever thought about calling in and put it off, we invite you to call in and talk about our topic of the day. The C-SPAN Networks, providing you access to public affairs on television, radio, and on the web. Afterwards, with Pete Early, Sergei Tretikov, and Peter Ernest continues. Welcome back, Sergey. Pete, I wanted to ask you, uh, Sergey, about what is uh, one of the, perhaps one of the most controversial things about the book, and that is your naming of a very prominent American, uh, Strobe Talbot, a former senior editor for Time, and the later, of course, uh, the deputy uh, deputy uh, uh, director of the deputy head of the State Department here in Washington, and you make it very clear in the book that. You did not, that you are not saying that Strobe Talbot was a spy. I think we Absolutely should make that not. very clear. Absolutely not. But you do identify, you use a, a term of art, an, a, an SVR term of art, as an unofficial 
uh, uh, source, an unofficial, unofficial special, trusted, yeah. unofficial special contact. A special contact. Now, mm -hmm. as I read the relation, the 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 your comments on Strobe Talbot, he had discussions with Mamedov, who was his counterpart, mm -hmm. the deputy head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and. I would expect in the course of such a relationship that there would be confidences, shared insights. I mean, part of people speaking at that level is, is not to just give formal papers, but to share confidence, insight, how we go about things. But I think the fact that Mamidov was a, an SVR co-optee, that is, he was cooperating with intelligence, therefore the information from Stobe Talbot made its way through intelligence channels rather than MFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs channels. Therefore, he carries this, this term, uh, an unofficial, special, or trusted contact. But, but I think it, it will probably be confusing for Americans. And you may want to comment on this yeah. too, Pete. One, one of the things you should realize is it's not only is he talking to someone who's a co-optee. Okay. The SVR is feeding that co-optee questions to ask. And that's important to remember. They're saying, when you get with this person, when you get with this high State Department official, try to turn the conversation this way. Try to ask this specific question. Try to get this information. And that is different than someone who represents the State Department. I mean, Strode Talbert would not, I assume, would not have allowed the CIA to come to him and say, ask this question, do this, do that. I'm sure he felt independent from them. And that's not the way the Russian was. Yeah. I, I understand the point you're making. Uh, what I would say, though, is no, I don't think Strobe Talbot would sort of take a list of questions right. off and see, but I do think that he would take, uh, that he would be prepared to meet uh, with a CIA, say, an analyst or a briefer who said, you know, Mr. Talbot, Mr. Right. Secretary, um, these are, there are a couple of issues we're very right. concerned about, and we would really appreciate learning any comments you make on this. I think he right. would take some questions from CIA. You're going beyond my knowledge there because I don't know how that functions. But I do know, according to Sergey, and he can address this himself, that the SVR looked at Strobe Talbot and thought, here is another American, here is another Westerner who's rushing in to save R Russia. And at that time, the Soviet Union had collapsed. Yes. It needed help. But yeah. I also think that what Sergey said was, the attitude was, we can massage his ego, we can play the helpless, the naive, we can say, we need your help, please, and by doing that, put him off guard and try to use him and manipulate him, because this is not the first Westerner who's rushed in to save, you know, Russia. Sure. Well, Pete and I have now both commented on what we think you mean. <laughs> you tell us what you think you mean. First of all, I never uh, called Mr. Talbot a spy or I think that he is an ardent American patriot. And uh, he was never my responsibility. Uh, but because of my p position in the center, I had access to some documents, to some files, where Strobe Talbot was called special unofficial contact. Just mostly for curiosity, I asked some generals, how come? Now, why you consider him uh, such an important source of information? And they, then they explained to me that Mamedov was used uh, to ask uh, Talbot specific questions. Of course, these two gentlemen, as far as I understand, they developed a good friendship. But, you know, it's my personal opinion. When you're in this high position, when you have access to top secrets, friendship with a foreign counterpart. For me, it uh, sounds a little bit strange, you know. Friendship is a good thing, but not when you uh, represent your country in official position. The only one thing I was told that uh, the good thing for Russians was that Mr. Talbot and Mr. Mamedov were, had meetings tete-a-tete. -tete. No third person uh, present. And again, uh, it's all I can tell you. Uh, but again, what that, uh, I want uh, to underline that Mr. Talbot wasn't in any way Russian spy. And, you know, one thing that Talbot was opening himself up for 
was that he doesn't know what the Russian is going back and saying. And it's quite possible, and Sergei was often watching this with his own officers, that what was reported back may have been highly exaggerated. I mean, we ran into this with Dobrynin and Kissinger and debates about that all the time, where the Russian official would go back and perhaps say things trying to impress his bosses. Oh, I got him to tell me this, advancing his own agenda. So it's just a bad situation when you get on that one and one. It, it would it would be tricky, and that's that's Absolutely. one of your points. Absolutely. And you know, people who were uh, who worked and who work in intelligence probably they understand that sometimes we want. Uh, look better than we are. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I think probably in some way we're all guilty. That, yes. that is, I think, a, a diplomat, an intelligence officer, a journalist, perhaps, yep. you know, he wants his story, his report, to, to look as good as it can, and, and that That's he succeeded in learning this, or he advanced uh, our country's goals by saying that. So there's, there is that element, I think, in, in almost all of us. And I think uh, when you have a third party there, that makes you self-censor. And that's, I think, your point, that things you might say, you know, privately uh, run, can run risky. It's so let's take this case, I think, and let's take the case of, of Strobe Talbot. Uh, and I understand that Mamadoff was a, a co-optee. Yeah. Would you, you wouldn't have any way of knowing that perhaps Strobe Talbot was quite close to the intelligence folks and was... Maybe, maybe we wouldn't say call him a cooptee, but, you know, maybe he accepted intelligence. It's very possible that one thought that he's milking his opponent. Okay. The opponent was thinking, oh, I'm doing great because I'm milking him, you know. It's very, very possible. Uh, uh, and uh, as you know, in intelligence, it happens when it uh, reaches the point of uh, this dramatic conversation when I'm recruiting you. I am offering you something, something, we both put something on the table because you were thinking that you are recruiting me. I was thinking that I was recruiting you. And we came to the same <laughs> no, It happens. It's a paradox of... Uh, Sergei uh, tells a funny story about how they were recruiting a German. And one of the points of this book that he makes is that uh, many countries, uh, including NATO, will not uh, betray their own secrets, but they're happy to betray American secrets, that they feel like America's a superpower, it's an imperialist, so even though we're allies, allies, we will... Be. And they get this German and they're recruiting, recruiting, and he turns out that he's an intelligence officer from Germany who's trying to recruit them. <laughs> well, I think, uh, as we are both intelligence officers, we may have found ourselves in similar positions. Absolutely. Um, but it was valuable. Yeah. It can prove valuable. One of the things that struck me was uh, you give such incredible insight into the KGB, into the KGB SVR, and the practices, its approach to recruitment. And I, I was uh, struck by the fact that you regarded the UN as, as such a, a... We have an expression in American like shooting fish in a, in a barrel. Yes. Because you can't miss. Uh, and, and so in the UN, you made the statement here in the book, you said, if one of my officers could not recruit someone in the UN, what good was he? <laughs> could you expand on that? Uh, actually, UN is a very good place to recruit people. First of all, the whole world is, is presented. But it has a lot of drawbacks. I don't want to offend diplomats of any kind, but sometimes they are not very knowledgeable people. And a lot of people who work in the UN, they are more concentrated on things we regret or we deplore, how to put it into this paragraph. And they don't know real secrets. That's why uh, uh, we were trying to recruit people who had access to internal documentation those who could provide us with some intelligence, not knowing really the subject, but he can take something in his mission and bring it to us. And we were capable to make our own analysis. I uh, want to just stop briefly on basis of recruitments the SVR uses. There are four of them. It used to be ideological. Philby was recruited. Yes. 
This basis doesn't exist anymore. There is no any more communism. This base was replaced with political base of recruitment. To make it look simple, anti-American feelings. Yeah. When you go to some European countries, you go to some Middle, uh, Middle East countries, they, you know, a lot of people, as you know, don't like America. And they are ready to cooperate with the SVR because they don't like America. Second basis, moral psychological. It's blackmailing. Uh, we had a kind of unwritten understanding between uh, Russians and Americans not to, to abuse this base of recruitment because we have hostages, both of us. Something, you are blackmailing me, but there are American diplomats in Moscow who could be blackmailed too. But it basically exists. Third basis, the most, the most, the easiest to understand, financial. My money, your information. And the fourth, it was my first, I first introduced it, by the way. It's business base of recruitment. When we create for our source, I, uh, I don't like the word, word spy. Spies is just it's for, for, for novels, you know. When we create for a source business opportunities in Russia, legal, Person works, in, per person works in Russia, nothing wrong with it. He pays taxes. The business is legal. But with the understanding that this business was created by the FSB. And uh, again, UN, the, uh, in many recruitments, there is combination of different bases, elements from, in UN, the most effective was political base of recruitment. Anti-American. Anti-American. Yeah. Well, in, in Canada, he used this, and it's interesting, setting up a business in Russia legitimizes, as you know, the hardest part is paying and meeting with your person in your host country. So imagine if you had uh, uh, someone who you recruited in the United States and you set up a business for him, how easy it is to fly there on this business, get legitimate payments, and we don't have any idea what a widget is worth there, so if they got inflated prices, you bring it back. You know, it's, it's a good, it makes it much tougher to catch someone. And, and it sounds less, even less suspicious than being right. a consultant where you can't, say, where it's knowledge, <laughs> whereas you're saying it's a, it's a business. It's there's a something, business. There's widgets or something right. being sold. And it's, yes. it's legitimate. Yes. I'm, I'm not hiding that I'm working. I have my enterprise in Russia. Uh, I'm paying taxes. Nothing wrong with it. And, and you were the first to think of this in the SVR and, and were actually, uh, uh, actually recognized for it. It was, yeah. it was the first joint venture between SVR and FSK at that time. Uh, then it, uh, they changed yes. the name to FSB. Yeah, it'd be like FBI and CIA, yes. internal yes. and external. Yes. And was this? Uh, I spent several months, literally, in the FSB, dealing with um, Mr. Gominiuk and Mr. Balenko. They were two senior officers working in the North American Department of 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 uh, FSB. We were just planning the operation, and the most important thing was to find good people to perform the operation. And it was disaster. <laughs> A disaster, why? Because uh, these counterintelligence officers, they are different from us. They, are, you know, they use force, they, they work on the territory, yes. they can be pushy, and yes. I needed someone more, you know. Uh, finally, uh, we found a, 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 a candidate, which wasn't good, but anyway, they told me, enough is enough. You must pick one. And <laughs> you know, uh, I would like to just touch on another couple of things. The, the book is extraordinarily interesting, but you do touch on some of the very well-known cases mm -hmm. of, of recent years, and one of them is, is uh, Colonel Yurchenko. Mm -hmm. who, of course, uh, defected to this, uh, appeared to defect defected to this country. And then redefected. And then redefected. <laughs> and, and one of the most frequent questions that I get asked at the museum is, was Colonel Yurchenko a genuine defector or not? And you do touch on the case from your end of it, and I think your comments would be fascinating. Uh, actually, 
it was, I think it was 85. 85? Yes, I just joined the American department. I was a young starting officer and I thought that I won't survive more than six months in this department because the people were so bright, you know, and I thought that I'll never be someone like them. And then I had a first assignment to write an article for, uh, for internal magazine called Razvedchik, intelligence officer, about hero named, with name Yurchenko. He just returned back from, well, he escaped and then returned back to the service. And I asked, can I interview him? They told me, no, you cannot, but you must write the, the article uh, about the Russian hero. Well, how come? You're an intelligence officer. Figure it out, you know. I wrote this article. Of course, no, no concrete facts because I had no idea what he did. Uh, I, I just knew that what was his position. He was deputy head of the American department, deputy to famous Russian uh, intelligence general Yakushkin. Probably you somehow heard the name. And I wrote this, uh, this article, and then the one senior guy, he told me, thank you, Mr. Tretikov, that you wrote this article then we'll send this article to the personnel department and we'll attach you this article to your uh, personal dossier. It's, it's the end of your career. <laughs> why? I don't know. Why? Because you are an idiot. Yurchenko is a defect. <laughs> He's not a hero. <laughs> it means that they were still thinking how to present the case. And I'm sorry. Uh, and the paradox is that Yurchenko was decorated. They assigned him to NIRP, to a research institute, where he had no access to any secrets. But officially, he was given the uh, the very high internal decoration. He became the honorable Czechist. It's an honor. in order, in order, yes, an honorable member of of, of the organization. And they did it in order to, uh, to hide what happened in reality. Of course, he defected. I don't know what happened to him then. Probably he wasn't treated properly. I don't know. Uh, but when I finally met him briefly, he produced uh, on me a very strange impression. Probably he wasn't totally sane. I know one thing, that he was finding every other week, terminal illnesses with himself. All kinds, you know. He was reading me, me, uh, medical yes. encyclopedia, oh, oh, I have this, I'll die, and uh, this, is the, this is what I know about the case. Well, then I met him many, many times, just in the corridors. You, know. you had a comment. I'm sorry. Uh, well, Pete. this is what's so fascinating about espionage, as you know. It's that wilderness of mirrors and believing, is this person a defector, is he not? It, when I did the Walker book, I had people say to me, oh, John Walker didn't really betray his country. In a few years, they're going to release him to Russia, and he's going to be a double agent. And, you know, I mean, it, you can come up with any kind of nonsense. And the question is, how do you verify it? And with this case, you know, I talked to Americans. I talked to Ames about Yachenka. I talked to Russians about him. And I don't know of anyone who dealt with him personally who believed he wasn't a genuine defector. But you'll still have people who will see, you know, and, you know, Angleton's famous for seeing all these things and people yeah. defending it back and forth. And well, we read a lot of novels and we see yeah. a lot of movies. But, but my question back to you, though, is, um, <laughs> so you were regarded as an idiot for, for writing your article. However, here is uh, Yurchenko, who's... Uh, clearly, they understand that he did defect. He was not a yes, hero. And yet, he was decorated and, and, uh, and everybody, you know, he was not, he was not, he did not get the, the uh, treatment that Pugashev and uh, Motorin and uh, um, Polyakov did. I can answer this question. I heard Kruchkov. Uh, he put it this way. I tried to find polite words. Uh, Yurchenko was in a deep, bad substance. But he managed to get out of this bad substance by himself. 
He came back. Right. Yes. He was in the deep something, you right. know, but he managed to come back. Any defection is not something the intelligence service is proud of. It's a failure. It's a major, major, major failure. Then, in Russia, uh, then and now, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I envy uh, American bureaucrats. Whatever happens, nothing happens to, have to them. You did a hell of a job, you know, <laughs> something like that. In Russia, no. If there is a failure, it means some people must be sacrificed. Somebody must be punished. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why when you reach some high position, you always think when you sign a document. Because if something goes wrong, they'll find, uh -huh. who authorized this particular operation or... Well, in, in the case of Yurchenko, uh, you spell out very clearly in your book mm -hmm. uh, that General Yakushkin was forced to resign. Uh, not because... Yurchenko and the others. Matorin and... Uh, okay, and the others. The others, and they, they told that uh, American uh, Department of the SVR and the American branch, not only, uh, not only uh, geographical, uh, political intelligence, but science and technology, became the nest of spies. And they needed, yes. they needed uh, a Scape scapegoat. Someone must, must be sacrificed. But again, with Yurchenko, it wasn't that simple. Uh, first of all, Yurchenko was not supposed to go abroad at all because he worked in the Department mm -hmm. of Internal Security, period. These people, they, have, they cannot leave the country Till they die, you know. They, they, they are not authorized. It was an exception. Who approved this exception? Khrushchev himself. It means to make uh, a loud case from you, it means Khrushchev would expose himself. Yes. That's why in many cases uh, there are no much waves because too many high ranking people were involved in the case. Okay. And if they start making waves, they expose it themselves. There was also the, the, the sense, and of course you, you know the Ames case very well, there was also a sense in American intelligence that, that Yurchenko was, was not punished in order to conceal Ames, who was a new reporting source to the SBR. They did not want to reveal what they knew what Ames might have reported, and therefore Yurchenko was recognized as a hero. Uh, it's possible, but you know they executed so many people. Yes. After, uh, and uh, I always ask myself a question, how unprofessional was it to start killing people immediately? The death row for uh, intelligence officer was like four, six months maximum. It's not like in the United States. People die of natural causes in jail. Yes. And uh, it was a kind of, uh, in my opinion, very unprofessional because they exposed by the fact that the sources, that they, at least they knew that, uh, pe uh, that there, there, there were sources uh, somewhere uh, in the American intelligence uh, community. I, I think, uh, just as a final note before we close, are you, are you at all optimistic about what is going on in Russia now? No. What is your comment? I mean, and this is because you used the word when we first began talking that you escaped. Yeah. And do you still have that sense that, that about the situation in Russia? Uh, that it's something to escape from? It's not even the matter of who is in charge, Putin or Medvedev, who will replace Putin and Putin will replace Medvedev. I think it's a pathetic, uh, very uh, stupid game, you know. Everyone understands what's going on in the reality that Putin will, wants to, to stay in power in any way. Uh, the whole system, uh, how they run the country, is, is evil. It's based on wrong principles. They don't think about the uh, well-being of Russian, po Russian people. They always repeat that they have uh, tremendous social programs, uh, whatever. Uh, go to Russia. I have a Russian satellite dish. I'm, I'm watching Russian TV. 
Moscow, St. Petersburg, probably some more few places. The rest is 17th century. People don't have running water. Uh, in one estimate, I heard that there are uh, productive po population in Russia, not more than 17 millions. Other either too old or uh, chronic drunks. Who improved the situation? Where is the improvement? And at the same time, and it's, for me, it's disgusting how uh, there's not the best people spending thousands, millions, in a very tasteful way, you know. Uh, I always compare, like Mr. Buffett, I don't know, American billionaires. They all help the society. They donate their money. They live very modest lives, by the way. I think that Buffett is still yes. driving yes. an old Volvo and something like that. I read it somewhere. Yes. Because he is a good, he is a good citizen. Those who are running the, the country, you know, uh, it's uh, not an exaggeration. When I had to shake hands with these people, I was rushing all the time to the men's room to clean my hands. Well, Sergey. Pete Early, the author of Comrade J, and uh, Sergey Trechikov, uh, the subject of Comrade J. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for being my guest this morning. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I would like to start with you, Pete. This is a, an extraordinary story. Uh, it is a story that is, it is the most up-to-date story we have had of a, a, an intelligence officer of uh, Sergei Trechikov's rank choosing to defect to the United States. And he tells an incredible story. And as I read the book, which is quite fascinating, one of the first things that happened when you were approached about doing this story was you said, no, you were not interested. Yes. <laughs> so I, I think it would be interesting for us to know, how did you become interested? Well, I became interested uh, when I actually met Sergei. I, received, I had done books about the John Walker spy case and about Aldrich James, the CIA traitor. And uh, periodically, I got calls from people from the KGB saying, oh, I want to tell you my life story. And most of them weren't very interesting. And so I said, no, I'm not interested, I'm not interested. And then a friend of mine from the FBI called. And he said, you need to meet this person. He didn't give me a name. And so I said, OK. And then it was very dramatic. I, I, they told me, arrive at this place at this time. And when I got there, two FBI agents were there. They took me up to a suite where there were two CIA agents. And in walked Sergey. And they, I knew instantly that he was somebody important because I actually remembered his name from when he defected. And he was a mystery. He defected in 2000 and disappeared off the grid. And I knew he was the highest ranking Russian intelligence officer to defect. And of course then, as I spoke to him, the story got better and better. Well, you tell a fascinating story. Let's turn to Sergei Trechikov. You took an extraordinary step with your life. Yes. Uh, you took an extraordinary <coughs> risk with your life. Uh, we're very fortunate to be with us today. We're very glad to have you. Let me go back to, rather than go all the way back in your life, which I would like to divide the KGB, yes. where people would stab one another in the back. And, and yet you still, there were certain people you trusted, but others that, that you, I mean, it was, there were so many people you could not trust. I mean, it, was just, it sounds like a, a, an incredibly almost gangster-like situation. Yes, to some extent, yes. The life in KGB, the whole logic of KGB, it's quite difficult to understand for Westerners, for Americans. Uh, that organization was very cruel towards the, the population. But believe me, this organization was even much more cruel towards, towards their own representatives, uh, like these ex executions. And I remember Khrushchev, who deceased not long ago, he was the head at that time of the first chief directorate of KGB intelligence. Uh, he was very proud to announce, like, uh, traitor Matorin executed, and we're all standing and applauding. Uh, I, uh, 
I, uh, I'm rethinking this situation, you know, and I was asking myself uh, what I thought at that time. When I was applauding too, I knew Matorin, he was a very nice guy. And I felt pity for him. He is a human guy, uh, being, he is a nice person. But I thought, yes, it's the way to go. He betrayed the organization, he betrayed the country. And uh, you must understand how dramatic it was to me, to my family, to go, uh, to become what we became. Yes. And uh, I always uh, underlined that I never did it for money. I was never approached. I had a very bad reputation. I was never seduced. I was never bought. It was our decision. And, and I thought that intelligence is one of the, uh, of the best opportunities. I had a skyrocketing career. For three years, in, in the beginning of my career, I was the head of the Young Communist League of the Intelligence. Uh, I was uh, captain at the time, but my status was of a lieutenant general. Uh, I was always successful, and uh, people like me usually don't defect. I never had any financial issues, problems. I was a successful officer. Definitely, uh, if I returned back to Russia, I would be general or even something more. It means that general or with a very high position. I was offered many uh, positions like this. And then I defected. Probably for my former colleagues, it's the main question they're asking. What drove this guy to, the, to, to that decision? Uh, when I was the head of, for example, Young Communist League, Komsomol of the Intelligence, uh, a lot of dramatic uh, events took place in the intelligence. Uh, people who were betrayed by Ames, then Hansen, were arrested and executed. And I attended <clears throat> some trials on Varovsky Street. It's where they were trialed. Believe me, even for someone with good nervous system, it's quite an experience to attend these trials. Uh, they were all uh, organized uh, to scare us, to show what will happen to you if you defect or if you do something wrong. It means in my particular case, I knew what exactly awaits me in case of failure. Because all these people who were executed, they never had, they never was even close to my position in the intelligence. But again, uh, it was a dramatic decision. Due to an extent. I would just like to ask, you have now lived in the United States uh, since you came actually to uh, Manhattan to be the number two head of what would be the equivalent of a CIA station, the Residentura. Mm -hmm. Uh, you chose to defect in 2000. You've now lived here uh, since that time, so in almost 10 years. Um, eight years. Mm -hmm. Eight yeah, years. Right. 2000. I escaped uh, in October 2000. Yes, October 2000. And you have also since then become an American citizen. Two years ago, uh, we became American citizens. I mean, uh, my wife, my daughter, and myself, and we're very proud, and it was one of the happiest days in our lives. The story of Comrade J, which would have been your name inside the, inside the KGB, um, was Comrade Jean, as I... As I Jean, Jean. Jean, French. Yes. And you would have been a... a and you depict yourself as an extraordinary loyal, uh, very effective, uh, uh, KGB, later SVR, SVR officer, that was the successor organization. And yet, uh, the story that you tell is one of great, great disillusionment. Mm -hmm. Can you just, in a, in a few words, give us a sense 
of the nature of that disillusionment because you had everything going for him. You were a success story. You had come in, you had been trained, you had survived the sort of vicious infighting that can take place in the KGB, later SVR, and you were on the, you were on the cusp of becoming a general. And being a general in the KGB uh, is equivalent to having arrived. It is, it is the C, it is the top position. And yet you became disillusioned. What was behind that disillusionment? First of all, I was raised as a patriot. And when I chose to work for the KGB, for the Russian intelligence, it, was, it wasn't the matter of money. It was the matter uh, I wanted to serve my country in the most effective way. Uh, we became disillusioned. We, I mean, the whole family. First of all, my wife and myself, because daughter, my daughter was too young just to, to think about things like this at that time. Uh, and to make this story short, I decided, we decided to do something, finally, to do something useful in our lives. And not to serve the people who call themselves a Russian government and uh, who perform, in my opinion, the genocide of Russian people, of people who live in, in, in Russia. And I had a choice to become part of this genocidal team or to do something else. You know, you, you describe uh, going to the trials of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, KGB officers who were tried and executed. I'm thinking there's one incident in your book uh, within a few pages where there were, in fact, uh, uh, trials and executions of three officers, Pigasov, Motorin, and uh, yeah. Polyakov. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were then, I think, about 29 years old. Roughly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. Uh, you described going to a, KG, a dinner of other KGB officers where the executions were announced, when the executions were announced, and everyone stood and applauded. Yes. Um, and I was among those who applauded. But, I, I, and, but, I, but, I, but in the book, it's quite clear that, that and you say in one, in one passage that you realized that you were in an organization where to succeed, you had to be a wolf. And yeah. so you would have just as sharper teeth than anyone else. Absolutely. But having joined the, the having been in the Young Pioneers, have, having been quite patriotic, you, you were a true believer. We use that phrase, a true Absolutely. believer. What was it like then as you moved up the ranks and you were exposed to this uh, uh, incredibly intimidating situation, execution, uh, everybody applauds. And then you also, and this comes out so clearly in the book, the very vicious infighting inside.